Realm Presents Remade, Season 1, Episode 15. This wasn't the family Inez would have chosen for herself. But then again, neither was the family she had left behind that fateful day at the beach. That stupid asshole lifeguard. At least her real family had known they had to make choices together in order to survive. It was just her luck that she'd be stuck with a group that still had to learn that. She'd watch out for them, though. And whatever else happened, she would make sure they stuck together. Even if she wanted to throw one of the members of her new family off the nearest building. That particular bag of dicks, Holden, still sat hunched over in the corner of the room. He wouldn't meet her eyes. She felt a twinge of guilt. Then she pushed it away. She had shit to get done. Most everyone had scattered for supplies, but Teddy and May were still here. Teddy, because he wasn't particularly concerned. May, because she was getting that look on her face. The stage passed panic, the shut-down look that comes when the brain and body just can't take any more stress. The group couldn't afford to drag any dead weight in the upcoming flight. May, Inez shouted over the sound of the warning sirens. Even though she had to shout, she was careful to keep her tone businesslike and non-confrontational. I'm glad you're still here. Could you see to inventory as everyone comes in? Make sure they aren't forgetting anything essential. Inez paused for effect. How do you think we should organize it? By type? May blinked. Then her delicate eyebrows came together thoughtfully. No, evenly distributed. That way, if we lose a pack, we haven't lost all our medical supplies or weapons or whatever we had. Good call. Inez watched as May moved to a better area of the room for staging. Hiram was back first. Inez suspected he had a ready-to-go pack at all times anyway, because he was always brightly chirping something about, be prepared. Hiram, she said. You and Alex get to work on the food machines. Pump out as much as you can between now and when we leave. Alex, the weird, silent kid, always skulked near the food machines anyway, as though afraid to let them out of his sight. As they got started on stockpiling food, Nevaeh and Cole returned. Between them, they lugged several bulky packs. Med supplies, Nevaeh said. There was a tone of vague disapproval directed at Inez, probably because of the way she had treated Holden. Inez shrugged it off. She didn't have time for Nevaeh's reproach. Over here, May said, hands on hips and all business. Good. Inez had nothing to worry about when it came to supplies. Which left. Hey. Inez nudged Holden with her foot. His expression was equal parts despair and defiance. This would have been a lot more pleasant to organize without the ear-splitting sirens going off the whole time. She held up the smooth black disc he had given her. It fit neatly into the palm of her hand. And, according to the AI, it carried everything they needed to find their future. The reason they were here. Maybe a way for them to get back, even. So that wasn't massively nerve-wracking or anything. She turned it over in her palm, studying it. Don't suppose this came with one of those car remotes, so we can turn off the panic function? He almost smiled. She almost wanted him to. So, the tunnels. I can lead us, he said a hint of hope creeping into his voice. Like hell you can, Inez thought. No, you can show all of us how to use it. As you're so fond of reminding me, I have no idea what we're up against with the killer robots. Thanks to you, we might not all make it out alive. So the more brains that know the way, the better. The sirens were a clarion call through the darkness, though perhaps carrion call was a more apt description. Along the borders of the city, creeping with all the twitching grace of hundreds of years of metallic madness, the caretakers came. Some tested the failing defenses. They fell back, or fell down, or, in one case, fell through. Others settled in patiently. So many things to accomplish. Red eyes fixed on the center of the city, on the tasks to be accomplished there. At the northern end of the city, Five caretakers had been waiting 300 years to get back in. Tonight, they would be able to work. 
If machines could feel, they would have wept for joy. Three hundred years they had kept their vigil. Three hundred years they had waited. And now, at long last, they could transport waste materials out of the city. A hulking caretaker found them there. Its five eyes, wired in odd places, some half hanging off, pulsed as it ripped them apart. Piece by piece by piece, with precision anything but surgical. Then, emitting a sound almost like a child humming, it began to sort through the parts of them it would use to decorate itself. It had another job tonight, and it wanted to be in the best shape possible for hunting vermin. On the eastern end, within view of the park Umta had made home, a caretaker busied itself with the trees. It ripped them up by their roots. Setting aside the ones that were shaped wrong, it replanted those that met whatever parameters for approval still ran in ones and zeros through its tortured processes. Good tree, bad tree, good tree, bad tree. The defenses were breaking down. There were other things that would be pruned that night, and the tools for pruning were ready. Waiting. It was the right thing to do, Holden said, so softly that Inez almost didn't catch it over the general hubbub of the room. Not to mention those damn sirens. Inez scanned the progress. The packs were almost finished. May was directing Gabe in the distribution of weapons. The girl with the curly red hair, Amelia, was helping pack the food. Zunita swore as the glowing softball she was trying to fasten to her pack bounced to the ground. Jingwei would have figured out a better way to do this. There was an instant hush, filled with memories Inez didn't share. But she sure as hell shared their tension and fear. Teddy, Inez said. She tossed the disc to him. Show everyone how to use it. Teddy smiled knowingly, holding out both arms. His voice boomed theatrically through the room. No one likes dry lips, with patented smoothing technology and the... He paused with a fake, exaggerated frown. How anyone had ever bought his acting as real on football nights, Inez would never know. But he had successfully cut the tension. Everyone was either smiling or groaning good-naturedly. He shook his head. Sorry, wrong commercial. What are we advertising here? Inez deliberately did not look at Holden as she said, A magical map out of the city to an unknown destination where we might find some answers. Right. These plans were obtained at great cost of life. Inside, we'll find a schematic for the Death Star. Who here wants to run to Tashi Station to pick up some power converters? Oh my god, Saya said. Nerd? The talk is clicking. He grinned. Fine. All you need is a thumb, like so. He placed his thumb firmly in the middle of the disc. A glowing, 3D schematic popped up. This is the city. He twisted the disc, then poked somewhere in the middle. It zoomed in, showing a street lined with buildings. A faint green pulse in the middle of the blue lines glowed. I think that's where we are, and here... He pointed to the street, then shoved his finger through. The street went transparent. The veins and arteries that fed the city showed now, outlined in red. One was a tunnel going straight, with a lot of offshoots. That's our way out. How do we know where we're going? Gabe asked. Teddy lifted his hand above the image, gesturing upward. The schematic zoomed out, once again showing the whole city in miniature. And then it kept zooming and zooming, and zooming. The city became nothing but a point of light, with their pulsing green light there. And, on the other side of the map, a second green light glowed like a beacon. I think the disk is the first light, so it'll show up wherever we are, and we can track our progress toward... whatever. He shrugged. So that's it? May said. Head toward some light on a map, given to us by a suicidal machine. This is our plan? Go. Now. Everyone turned, startled. Umta was in the doorway. Her shoulders were hunched, her eyes darting everywhere. She clutched a wicked-looking, thick spear. Hurry, she said. Holden stood, tightening his pack. I can scout ahead with Umta. 
Inez shook her head. No, we should stick together. The nearest tunnel entrance is to the north. Which is... She glanced at Hiram. Hiram dutifully pointed north. Exactly. Teddy clapped him on the shoulder. So, if you get lost, make sure you have a Hiram with you. Does everyone have a Hiram in their packs? Hiram smiled delightedly, rubbing the back of his head. Sebastian, who had managed to find something like eyeliner to goth up his look, rolled his eyes. Holden looked like he wanted to argue some point. He stepped closer to Inez, leaning in. She gritted her teeth as she finished lashing as many supplies to the outside of her pack as she could. She hefted it. Too heavy. But she doubted that would be a problem for very long when they were back out in the wilderness. Holden's words ran over one another, as though by talking fast, he could drag her along with him. Scouting with Umta is the least I can do, and I'll be safe with her. I'm not going to let you get yourself killed because you feel bad. I don't feel bad. He paused, taking a deep breath. I'm not going to apologize. We aren't safe here. We never were. I did what had to be done. The longer we stayed here, the harder it would have been to leave. You know that. We would have waited the night, and in the morning, things would have felt calm. Safe. So we would have decided to wait and see what happened. Just like last time, when Umta said, leave, and I knew she was right. But we listened to the people who wanted to stay. They're dead now. Or maybe it would have been nothing like last time. You don't know. No, I don't. But is this really what you want? To live out the rest of our lives in an empty city? Inez growled in frustration, shaking her head. No. And goddammit, you might even be right. But you did it the wrong way. We could have scouted, sent out a party, taken time and thought, kept the city as a backup option. Holden shook his head, mouth an emphatic line. The city deserved to die on her own terms. Can you imagine what she's been going through all these centuries? No, I can't, because she's not a person. Holden, I might be the biggest bitch in the world. Actually, if this world is as empty as it seems, the odds are very good that I am. But you put the feelings of a fucking machine ahead of the safety of the group. You can't do that. He shrugged, still shaking his head. We have to move on. If we left her turned on, we would have come back. Things would have gotten hard, and we would have turned around and run back. Inez pinched the bridge of her nose. She breathed in deeply. You know what? Yeah, we couldn't have stayed here forever. And maybe there's hope for us out there. Answers, a way back. But in making that choice for everyone, you took away our right to control our own lives. We've already had our futures snatched away. You don't get to decide for us anymore. No one does. I'm sorry for that part. I really am, but... No more buts. Get your pack on. And you bet your ass that if I die out there, I'm taking you with me. Holden walked away. But he didn't slink with his shoulders stooped. He walked with gritty confidence, looking around the room with his head held high. She should have hit him harder. She shouldn't have hit him at all. Sighing, she reached down for the last item. The one she hadn't packed. The gold cross glittered in her palm. Where Asaya had gotten it, Inez didn't know. It was a link to her past. But maybe also a link to her future. She fastened it around her neck. When she looked up, she caught Saya watching. It wasn't a time for smiling. But what passed between them felt almost like hope. Most of the shelters were still intact. Jingwei would have been gratified to see how her handiwork had held together. No animals had moved back into the area. The scent of the teens was still too strong. Several of the traps in the forest held rotting carcasses, the final gift of humans to nature. It would be a while yet before nature reclaimed this land for its own. The caretakers were gone. There was nothing here for them anymore. Some followed the trail, incapable of abandoning their mission when humans still lingered. One caretaker had stayed long after the others, though. It couldn't leave behind a mess. It had to take care of the humans. That much of its code was still intact. Near the fire pit, where everyone had gathered to laugh, to eat, to sit, a new feature had been added. 
in the moonlight, shining white like letters of some unknown alphabet, were a series of bones. Each had been cleaned, neatly stripped of ruined flesh and shredded skin. The bones that were broken had been put back together as much as possible. Here, a row of ribs, devoid of what had beat inside them. There, a line of femurs. Finally, round skull after round skull. Eyes black, gaping holes, staring up forever at the sky. The skulls that weren't as pretty, smashed or cut in half, have been kept separate. No one wants to display an ugly skull. Empty sockets stared up at the empty sky, no longer seeing, no longer hoping or dreaming, just eternally waiting. Hey, the sirens are getting quieter, Hiram said, his eyes bright and hopeful. Gabe patted his shoulder. Yeah, man, that's not a good sign. Nevea was fussing over coal. May and Sunita were arguing over Sunita's load and Loki prowled near the door like a caged animal. Umta had already gone back outside. Everything was ready. Inez took a deep breath, willing some calm into herself. She wasn't going to lose anyone. I'm sorry, Teddy said, bumping her with his shoulder. For what? My brain is getting scary again. I was kind of proud of this city for us. It was nice, right? Should have known it couldn't last, though. Inez wrapped her arms around him, resting her head on his broad chest. Normally she would have teased him, or reminded him, yet again, that this was all real. But the impulse to correct his delusions was absent. On top of everything else going on, she couldn't handle Teddy feeling like this was all his fault. She needed him. His infectious charm, his calm in the midst of panic, would be useful. Even if it was based in delusion, Besides, sad Teddy made her sad too. Sadness was a luxury in which she couldn't indulge. Nah, the city was cool, but it's getting boring. That's probably what this is. You're bored and ready for a new adventure. I bet you're making a fantastic one for us. I can't wait to see what's next. Teddy laughed, patting the top of her head. Anyone else would get a swift elbow to the stomach for a move like that but she wasn't ready to let go of the hug yet. I'm so glad I know you, she whispered. She wouldn't have chosen this life, but she would never choose to give up this bizarre friendship with Teddy. Maybe they'd start their own reality show when they got home. Cruise for chicks together in between intensive psychotherapy sessions. Teddy pulled back from the hug. I promise to do my best to create a seriously kick-ass adventure for you. How do you feel about octopi? Like eating them? No, like hanging out with them. I saw a documentary once where they imagined what the world would be like way far in the future. Everyone agreed that squid and octopi would be the next species to evolve into societies. Maybe we'll go discover an octopi utopia. Please tell your brain a firm no on that one. They're so creepy. All those tentacles? Fine, I'll think about something else. But you have to admit... My brain has been pretty good to you so far. Inez looked up at him dubiously. Your brain trapped me in a cheerleader outfit. Yeah, but it also very unselfishly gave you Saya. Inez glanced over to where Saya was helping Sebastian tighten his pack. She blushed, then slapped Teddy's arm. Hush. You're welcome. He grinned, then cupped his hands over his mouth. All right, buddy system. Everyone team up with whoever you find the most attractive. Horrified faces looked back at him as everyone froze in place. Asshole, Inez said, laughing. Everyone pair up with whoever is right next to you. Teddy, bless him, had again managed to cut through some of the tension by distracting them with other tension. Everyone laughed awkwardly, shuffling closer to the person next to them, which, as far as Inez had been able to suss out, was almost in line with Teddy's original directive. Gabe stood protectively next to May. Cole and Nevea nodded stoically at each other. Sunita darted across the room to be by Loki, which Inez did not get. But then again, she just didn't get liking guys in general. Sebastian and Amelia awkwardly nodded at each other. Alex stuck with Hiram, and Saya. 
Seiya walked past Holden and joined Inez and Teddy. Inez knew it was wrong to be excited right now. She was anyway. Let's go, my imaginary friends, Teddy said, leading the way. If you're all really good, we can have a tea party later. The shower still steamed. The locker room stood, silent and empty. The football field was bathed in floodlights day and night. The restaurant had more or less survived the explosion, but it was definitely worse for wear. A lone pizza stood sentinel on the remaining table, and the black couch in front of the yellow wall was there, waiting, confessionless. At the railroad track, looking in the direction its stars had gone, the caretaker waited too. It had crafted everything perfectly. It had accessed all the records. It had made everything how it had once been. It knew what human life was supposed to be. Alone, it had done what it was programmed to do. It had snatched its humans. The male with all the historical records, and the female that was not quite right, but almost fit, and brought them here without the others knowing. Because the rest of the caretakers had other programming, wrong programming. This caretaker knew what human life had been. It had accessed all the records. The records were complete. It accessed the records now, always, playing them inside its artificial brain like favorite memories. It knew how to make human civilization again. Everything was perfect. Everything was ready. Alone, it would wait. The male and the female would come back. After all, this was where they belonged. It was what they were built for. The nearest service tunnel entrance wasn't far. Small blessings, Inez thought. It hit her with a pang of homesickness. Her mommy was fond of pointing out every mildly positive thing as a blessing. Inez was fond of referring to her cousins as small curses in response. At least she didn't have to herd those little monsters here. They were safe. Small blessings. With the sirens echoing through the streets, though even fewer alarms were sounding now, and several of the buildings in the distance had gone dark. They found the hatch down to the tunnels. It lifted easily on hydraulic arms. Umta regarded it with something like horror. She hadn't liked the confines of buildings. Tunnels were probably even worse. Holden stood to the side with her, talking low and resting his hand tentatively on her arm. Loki, Inez said, do you think it would be better for you to scout a little ahead in the tunnel, or for everyone to stick together? She hated to pretend like she thought he had any actual expertise in these matters, but he had the only worthwhile weapon. And honestly, she didn't know which was the better course. I offered to scout, Holden said. His tone was curt. Loki tugged at his chin. He seemed to address Holden more than Inez. We haven't seen any threats yet and the AI said the tunnels were clear. So it depends on whether or not you trust the AI. It could be leading us into a trap, but it had ample opportunity to kill us already, so I'm not sure. We trust the AI, Holden said. Inez fought the overwhelming urge to throttle him. Holden's word was good enough for Loki, as usual. He tapped his fingers on his gun. I say stick together then. Less experienced and weaker in the middle. You can be in charge of them, Inez. Oh, can I? Thank you. He ignored her dripping sarcasm. I'll scout in front with Sunita and Holden. Gabe, Teddy, and Umta watch the rear. Did he just put me in the weaker group? Saya said. I'll hand his pasty ass to him on a platter. Inez snorted. Oh, God. A pasty Loki-ass platter sounds like the worst restaurant combo ever. Saya laughed, biting her bottom lip. Inez wanted to do that for her. But survival first. Figuring out her feelings for Saya, and whether Saya's attraction to her was real, or just a reaction to all the craziness around them. After. Because it hurt to think about, but Inez really doubted Saya would have given her a second glance in their former lives. Inez would have been into Saya, no question. But would probably popular, effortlessly beautiful Saya have you even noticed her? Inez hated the idea of being alone, 
but she hated the idea of being what someone settled for, out of lack of any better options, even more. Because, damn it, she was hot shit, not someone you settled for. These thoughts occupied her as she climbed down into the tunnel. Several of the teens had attached the glowing softballs to their packs, giving them enough ambient light to navigate by. Loki held up two fingers, then pointed forward, making a few other gestures that Inez interpreted as, keep your eyes open, be quiet, and I'm making this all up to feel important. Everyone started down the tunnel at a brisk pace set by Loki. She had to give him credit for that, at least. They were moving swiftly, but not so fast that it was a strain for anyone to keep up. At this rate, they would make good time out of the city. But was it better to leave the tunnels under cover of night, or at first light? She doubted the murder robots had any problem with night vision. It was a conversation for later. The tunnel was straight and smooth, wide enough for two of them to walk abreast. So far, they had passed two intersecting branches, and one ladder leading back up to the surface. Saya stayed next to her, their shoulders brushing. Inez wanted to say something to her, anything, and had just opened her mouth to remark it was good that none of the group had died in a freak mining accident when Loki yelled from ahead. Hold up. They all shuffled forward, jostling as they tried to see through to what he had run up against. Inez assumed if it was a murder robot, he would have sounded a little more terrified. Teddy pushed through, and she followed in his wake. He was so useful, her giant teddy bear of a boy. Loki was stopped in front of a pile of rubble, laced with massive tree roots. It's impassable, he said, kicking at a chunk of what looked like concrete, but bounced more like rubber. Who knows how far until it's clear again? Holden was bent over, trying to pry up a huge chunk, impossibly tangled in roots. Hey, Inez said, anger boiling like acid in her stomach. Remember that fun detail the city told us about how there were sections of the city she couldn't feel anymore? Looks like this was one of them. We could have scouted this out before. This is why we needed more time. And where is the damn blast that was supposed to take out all the electronics? Huh? It didn't happen. Holden flinched. Inez realized it was because he expected to get hit again. Shame flooded through her, more bitter and burning than her anger. She didn't want to be that person, to introduce that into the group. Any level of violence or force was a dangerous slope. They were full-on Lord of the Flies out here. And while any idiot could see that the entire story would have been different if girls had been on that island. After all, so far this group had managed to avoid conches or piggies. Power dynamics were hard to de-escalate. Sighing in disgust, whether at herself or Holden, she no longer knew. She pulled out the disc. The side tunnels they had passed branched out in either direction without cutting back the way they needed to go. And they couldn't know if they were blocked too. Best option looks like back the way we came. There was a ladder about 30 minutes ago. Above ground? Holden asked. Loki answered. If we can follow the line of the tunnel, we can get past the blockage up there. And if we hit more, there are some promising lines farther up. He pointed to a few offshoots that seemed to go in the same general direction. Best to stick with the clearest routes. Otherwise, we could wander for who knows how long. Fine, we're losing time. Inez walked faster than she should have, almost jogging. She pushed through the group of waiting teens, letting Loki explain the new plan. She needed space to think, to clear her head, to breathe out some of the anger and disgust so she could process what she needed to do in order to keep everyone alive. But Teddy was at her side within a minute. Saya, too. They kept up with her pace, climbing the ladder out into the night. They were still in a maintained area of the city, but things were flickering sporadically. Sidewalks around them sped up and then ground to a halt. Inez looked the direction they needed to go and found a building the size of several city blocks. Teddy stretched his arms over his head, yawning. I thought you were going to hit him again. Inez sighed. She couldn't meet either his or Saya's gaze. I shouldn't have done it in the first place. He already feels worse than I can make him feel. Teddy grinned, making a fist and flexing his considerable biceps. 
than you can make him feel, maybe. Thea let out a small, disapproving noise. He thought he was doing the right thing. That counts for something. Inez gritted her teeth, hating to say anything good about Holden in front of Saya. But he wasn't the competition. There was no competition. There was only life or death. Don't get me wrong, I'm still super pissed at him. But I'll be nicer to him in front of everybody. We all have to stick together to make it through. There aren't that many of us. We can't afford to lose anyone. Not again. Not on her watch. She turned as Hiram popped out of the service hatch. She watched the streets for any threat. I'm the goddamn lifeguard now. That asshole. The hot springs steamed merrily in the night. The mirror caretaker had left without a trace. The teens who had sheltered there had not. Though the larger ecological footprints of the people who had long since disappeared from the earth were finally being erased, the small footprints of these new usurpers littered the mud and dirt around the edges of the water. Wherever humans went, they left a mark. A ring of ash from a dead fire would linger for years. The makeshift latrine still smelled strongly and would keep smaller predators away for several weeks. And a few strips of discarded jumpsuit material, dirty red against the gray rocks, would have lingered for decades. Would have, were it not for the delicate metal pinchers that reached down and plucked up the pieces. A red eye, not dirty but glowing, took in the evidence. Then it passed it down the line of its companions. The end caretaker tucked the dirty scraps alongside other red fabric, these pieces stiff and browned with dried blood. The trail continued, and so did the caretakers. Farther behind them, wearing smashed bits of skull strung on a wire like a necklace, another caretaker tracked them. It didn't have to follow the trail. It only had to follow the followers and wait. If the tunnels had been claustrophobic, the open street felt even more choking with the palpable fear they all carried. Everyone was jittery, looking over their shoulders as they huddled together. Inez had pulled up the schematic of the city, and they tried to make sense of it. There's no straight shot out on the surface streets, May said. We'll have to weave through. Let's just go around this building and go from there, Gabe suggested. I don't like standing in the open. With no better choice, and movement always preferable, they set out. Loki went in the rear, watching behind them, and Inez had not a single snide thought left to spare. She envied him a little. He seemed to be almost getting off on the scenario. Okay, maybe she had a few snide thoughts still. Everyone else clutched their weapons with bloodless fingers. No one had range like Loki, so the weapons would only be useful in close combat. And if it came to that, they didn't stand much of a chance. Inez didn't like her own odds. She held her short spear at her side, her hand cramped around it. The sirens were gone. She hadn't thought she could possibly miss them, but now she desperately wanted them back. It was amazing how fast the city was changing, now that it wasn't alive anymore. The lights were going dead around them. Only a few emergency strips were lit along the roads. It was colder, too. The city must have pumped warmth up from the ground. Inez shivered, wishing she had worn more layers. It even smelled different. Maybe it was the cold, or maybe the city had regulated the air they breathed. But everything was sharper, more metallic. All the background noise was gone as well. Rather than the comforting hum of life, which she had never realized how much she depended on until their time in the wild, there was only the sound of their hushed footfalls as they hurried down the street, closer and closer to the edge of this hellishly long building. Interspersed were their breaths, ragged more from stress than exertion. And a clicking noise. A clicking noise getting closer. Run, Inez shouted, looking over her shoulder. Coming up fast behind them was a caretaker. Its arms held two trees, ripped up by the roots. Everyone stumbled into a sprint. Inez waved them past, determined to be last, so she could make certain no one was left behind. And everyone passed her, except Teddy at her side. He looked puzzled, like he couldn't decide whether or not to be scared. 
Damn it. She'd have to talk to him. But wait. Not everyone had passed her. Loki stopped, dropped to one knee, and breathed out. Then he took a shot. The caretaker lurched to the side, scraping hard against the ground. It dragged one of the trees behind itself. Then it powered off entirely. Inez was never, ever complaining about Loki again. She'd even order a pasty Loki-ass platter if she ever saw one on a menu. Loki stood, nodding to her. She nodded back. Then they ran to catch up with the group as they tore around the corner of the building. Wait, Inez shouted. Stop! Loki killed it. There's bound to be more, Cole said. We can't wait here, Nevea said, eyeing the streets around them. We know they can get in now. Inez held up her hands. I agree, but if we don't think things through, we'll get lost. We can't stop every few blocks to check the map. Loki stood on the corner, where he could see down all the intersecting streets. Something coming up fast. His tone was grim, but determined. Do we try to find another tunnel? Inez asked. May shook her head vehemently. I don't want to go back underground. There'd be nowhere to run. Gabe nodded, putting his arm carefully around her shoulder. I agree. Inez bit back her question of whether he actually agreed with the sentiment, or he just agreed with May. Loki didn't take his eyes off the streets. Then he swept them up the sides of the buildings. Caretakers can hover and climb walls. They have the advantage in this city, because they can come at us from any direction. If we're in a tunnel, they can only come from two. We can hold them off easier, too. Some of us can make a stand while the rest run. Inez shook her head. No one is making any stands. We get out together. Alex had been sidling silently away. Inez hadn't noticed, but Teddy nudged her. Alex, stop! Inez snapped, in her best imitation of her mommy's most terrifying voice. Alex hunched his shoulders deeper, but he stopped. We should keep going, Holden said. The tunnels can get us a good ways away from the city, undercover. Nevea moved her spear from one hand to the other. Cover is good? Umta grunted, in what Inez assumed was assent. Sebastian tugged at his hair, eyes wide. In the city, we can retreat, hide. It gives us more options. None of them good ones, Cole said. Saya was looking straight up at the night sky. The stars were coming out brighter and brighter, as the lights of the city died. Holden's right. We need speed and distance. The tunnels are still our best bet. Holden perked up, standing straighter. But Saya didn't look at him. Sunita pointed the way they had come. If we tried clearing the rocks... Gabe threw his hands up in the air in exasperation. No one has time for clearing rocks. Inez felt the situation spiraling out of control. Everyone was terrified. But they needed to make a decision, and fast. She looked up at Teddy, who nodded. Everybody shut the hell up. He smiled and added, Please? Thank you. Hiram raised his hand, like he wasn't sure if he had the right answer a teacher was looking for, but wanted to try anyway. Yes? Inez asked. The city is built on a grid, just like in Salt Lake City. Because the Mormon pioneers planned it so well, that even though they built it pre-technology, it- Hurry up, Hiram! Sunita shouted. Sorry. Mean, I just mean, if we cut this way, and then go straight for several blocks, we should meet back up with the tunnel far enough along that hopefully whatever was blocking it is gone. And we know that there are ways to get out of the tunnel, so if we have to come back up, we come back up. But we can use it as much as possible. We can just use the disc thingy, Sunita said. How long will it last, though? We have no idea what kind of battery, or whatever, it runs on. We should save it for when we really need it. Inez nodded. That's a good point, and a good plan, Hiram. He blushed, and Inez's heart broke. She would keep that sweet cinnamon roll of a boy safe no matter what. There are pros and cons to both. So right now, fast. Everyone gets a vote. But majority rules, absolutely. 
Once the vote is taken, we all go together. And we all support the decision. No second guessing. No fighting. No hitting. She paused, looking at Holden. I'm sorry for that, by the way. He nodded in acknowledgement. Inez continued. This is it. We're all we have. We live or die together. There was no grumbling, only solemn nods. Saya spoke first. All those in favor of finding the tunnel again and trying to get out that way? Holden. As soon as Holden raised his hand, Loki, Sunita, Nevea, and Umta followed. Saya raised hers after. Hiram and Amelia did too. Inez had hoped for this, had done her best to subtly shift it in this direction. But she hadn't wanted to push. She raised her hand. That's it then, Gabe said. May opened her mouth, but he took her hand and squeezed it. She let out a sharp breath, then nodded. Inez nodded back. Show us the way, Hiram. He took off, and they jogged behind him. Their breaths fogged out of their mouths, frozen vapor confirming they were still breathing. Inez clutched her cross, praying that she hadn't just doomed them all. If the frozen vapor of desperate breaths could leave the atmosphere, it might hover above the earth, somewhere near the station where those first breaths were taken. It couldn't get in, which was fine, because frozen breath vapor wouldn't care about such a thing anyway. Inside, red lights flashed, and an eternal alarm went off. Warning, warning, warning. But who was left to warn? And warn them against what? On a screen, a child nearing adulthood slumbered, the face smooth, innocent. It glowed red, then normal, then red, washed again and again by the warning lights. Red like the jumpsuit the child wore, red like glowing eyes, red like new blood. But the warnings went unheeded. The face slept on. Or perhaps the child hadn't started breathing yet. A single sentinel entered the image, scuttling in silent effort over the face. A face that had been forever ruined once. But no longer. Jingwei took her first breath. Again. And the caretaker watched, waiting. Hiram really was like a human compass. After about 20 minutes, that felt like several lifetimes, they found another hatch down to the tunnel. Cole grabbed the handle and pulled. Nothing happened. Let me. Gabe tried, straining. It's not working. Shit. Inez crouched down. Whatever hydraulics had helped them before, they were turned off like everything else. She very deliberately did not mention this or look at Holden. She was being nice. Nice. Nice was making her jaw ache with gritted teeth. She moved to the side as Nevea, Sunita, Cole, and Gabe got the best handholds they could. On three. One, two, three. Straining with all their collective might, they slowly pulled the hatch open. Sebastian darted close, dragging some sort of weird street art cube and shoving it under to prop the door open. Good thinking, Inez said grateful someone else had thought past getting the hatch open, to keeping it open. Sunita shook out her hands. On the bright side, even the caretakers might have a hard time getting these open. Or they won't even think to look in them. We'll knock this out when we're all in. Close it again. May frowned. But it'll be hard to get out in a hurry. Loki hefted his gun. I'm gonna scout. Give me ten minutes to make sure it's clear far enough to be worth our while. Hiram bounced eagerly on the balls of his feet. I'm a fast runner. I can go farther and check things out too. Inez opened her mouth to say no to the youngest member of their family. But she couldn't very well forbid Hiram to go down if she let Loki. Hell, it wasn't her place to forbid anyone. Wouldn't stop her if she needed to, though. With tightness in her throat, she watched Loki and then Hiram wriggle past the cube and into the hole. Holden stepped forward. Umta and I will go back through to the blocked part, 
and make sure nothing's going to be coming from behind. You don't have a good enough weapon, Inez said. Holden had what amounted to a sledgehammer. Umta must have given it to him. It was better than a wooden spear. It still wasn't enough. He shrugged, rubbing the back of his neck. No one does. She couldn't deny that. And she couldn't deny him this. He needed it. Plus, they needed him to do it, too. Inez moved to the side and let him and Umta by. Be careful, she said. Holden grinned. Yes, Mom. Before she could wither him with the force of her eye roll, he was down the hole, too. Umta followed slowly, a pained look on her odd face. There was another problem. What was it? Inez couldn't remember. There were too many problems to keep track of. Oh, yes. Teddy's failure to run before. Teddy, what do you think the killer robots represent? Inez asked. I honestly have no idea. Sorry about those. He shrugged sheepishly. Well, I think they represent your need to protect your own ass. So if we see another one, you run like hell, okay? He laughed. If you say so. Make a ring around it, Gabe was saying, pointing to the hatch. Everybody face out. That way we can cover every angle. They all moved closer, shoulder to shoulder, weapons pointed outward. What do you think we're even running toward? Sebastian asked. Does it matter? Cole sounded exhausted. Hell yes, it matters, Gabe growled. Answers, Nevea said. There was a core of strength in her voice Inez hadn't noticed before. She was obviously scared. They all were. But there was a determined intensity, too. We're running toward answers. Because if we can find out why we're here, how we're here, then we can find out how to get back. I'm glad to be alive, don't get me wrong. This is still better than what I was living. But I don't really want to spend the rest of my life playing Little House on the Prairie out in the wilderness. Sebastian laughed, but it sounded forced. The rest of our lives might not be very long. God, I don't want to die a virgin. Again. Aw, little buddy. Teddy reached right over Nevea's head and must Sebastian's carefully styled hair. Do you want me to imagine a girl for you to meet? Can we please stop talking? May hissed. They're out there. Everyone hushed. The momentary respite punctured. They shifted their weapons and watched to see whether death would come from above or below. The forest was verdant, greenery so thick it covered everything. Tree trunks were buried beneath layers of green moss. Rocks, once gray, were stained in green. Only flashes of bright flowers interrupted the lush monochrome. Once, there might have been a city here. But whether the few hills were actually hills or the remains of a civilization long reclaimed. It didn't matter. Everything was forest now. Where giant trees had fallen, other plants climbed over them, claiming the space, fighting for dominance. Things small, and decidedly not small, scurried or slunk or prowled through the sunless depths of the forest floor. Things slightly more blessed by evolution moved among the branches, many spending their entire lives in a single tree. When they died, they'd fall and be reabsorbed into the dirt, feeding their flesh back to the forest that fed them. It claimed everything in the end. Trees, animals, bodies, cities. Eventually, all was devoured by the forest. Except for one clearing. Here, there was no moss, no choking vines, no towering trees or feathered ferns. The ground was swept clean, Neat marks radiating out in circles for a space of twenty yards. At the edge of the line, the forest loomed, waiting to reclaim its rights. But the forest couldn't have it. In the middle of the clearing, a round, slate-gray building squatted like an intruder. Next to the door, their huddled shapes resting until something required their attention. Two metal sentinels curled in on themselves. From a distance, they looked almost like old ladies hunched in rocking chairs. 
The red eyes glowing in pulses did something to dampen that effect, though. Nothing required their attention at the moment. All was quiet. Quiet, with the promise of something to come. Quiet with waiting. Hey, Loki shouted. As one, the eleven teens still topside, turned and peered into the hole. It's clear as far as I went. Hiram is pushing a little farther to make sure we have at least two accessible hatches. But it looks good. Let's get this over with, May said, climbing right down. Gabe followed. Nevea passed down her long staff, then got onto the ladder. Inez was about to follow when there was a click, then the hum of something electronic. She looked up to find a monstrosity. The caretaker coming toward them was covered with arms. Some of them hung halfway off, twitching as though they weren't wired quite right. Most were razor sharp, sleek and efficient, and gleaming red with the reflected light of the caretaker's five eyes. One arm was blunt, more a tube than a blade. It was starting to glow, and it was pointed right at them. Before she could scream, Teddy stood with a roar. He charged, head low, shoulders thrown forward. Flesh crashed into metal, with all the practiced expertise of a star football player with a bright future. Teddy took the caretaker down, slamming into the ground on top of it. Gun! Inez screamed. Loki threw up the gun and she caught it. She ran, skidding to a stop. Teddy was still on top of the caretaker, holding it down as its limbs scrambled to right itself. He rolled to the side, taking the caretaker with him and exposing a back panel of wiring over a black cylinder. Inez pulled the trigger. The bolt struck deep with a hiss and a flurry of sparks. She shot it again. The third time she pulled the trigger, it clicked, empty. She reared back to use the gun as a bludgeon and beat the wiring out of the monster. But then its eyes, one by one, went dark. It's dead. Everyone get underground, she shouted over her shoulder. Trembling, she squatted onto her heels. Teddy, come on. She held out her hand to help him stand, but he stayed on his side, still tangled up in the robot. Or rather, the robot was tangled up in him. Inside him. No, 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 Inez whispered. Because when Teddy had charged right into the caretaker, he had charged right into one of those sharpened arms. Teddy tried to pull himself free. He screamed, once, a short and desperate sound that pierced Inez as surely as any blade. Then he gritted his teeth together and tried to smile. Ouch, he whispered. Inez kneeled down, hands fluttering uselessly above Teddy. The blade went straight through, a jagged puncture. In his torso, out his back. She could, she could stop the bleeding. But at which end? And if she pulled him off the blade, he'd bleed even more. She didn't want to hurt him. She needed to do something, though. Anything. There was already so much blood. Too much blood. Dark red, almost black, gushing out with every heartbeat. Teddy's life pulsed onto the street beneath him. And Inez couldn't stop it. She couldn't stop it. This really hurts, he said, already pale. I wish it didn't hurt so much. Doesn't seem fair. A sob escaped Inez's mouth, a low moan of despair. And then she bit it back. Sadness was a luxury. She didn't have time for it. She'd fix this. No, you're coming with us. You don't get to stay here. She put her hands on his chest, feeling his heart. Feeling it slow down. No, unacceptable. You owe me a better adventure than this. You promised. He lifted a hand and put it on her cheek. She looked into his eyes, her own blurry. But not so blurry she couldn't see the shift in expression. The shift away from playful resignation. Away from wonder and detachment. For the first time, Teddy was here. Really here. 
After everything they had been through, he finally knew it was real. Maybe he did before he dumped the caretaker. She didn't doubt he would have chosen to do it either way. Damn it, Teddy. She took a shuddering breath, trying not to cry. I told you to run like hell away from the caretakers, not toward them. Always been bad at following directions. Drove the producers nuts. They would have loved this plot twist, though. Great season finale. No, no, it's a to be continued. Inez nodded too fast, her throat so tight it hurt. Not the finale. Teddy smiled, then he coughed. More blood gushed out. His voice was slower, his breathing rattling. He stroked her cheek. You were the best part of me, he said. Don't forget. She leaned her forehead against his, unable to stop the sobs now. Please don't leave me. Beneath her hands, his heartbeat slowed. Slowed. Stopped. Someone was shouting her name. But she didn't want to get up. Couldn't get up. If only, if only this really had all been in his head. She wished with all the fierceness inside herself that they were figments of Teddy's imagination. Because that would mean she would wink out of existence, and this would stop hurting so damn much. She didn't want to live with this, to carry it with her. She didn't want to do this without Teddy at her side. But Teddy was gone, and she was still here. He was wrong about another thing. She wasn't hope. He was. And now he was dead. She pressed her lips against Teddy's forehead. His eyes were closed, his face peaceful. She stood. The weapon arm of the caretaker had been knocked loose. It didn't look like it originally belonged, which meant maybe someone besides this piece of shit monster could use it. She grabbed it and wrenched it free, a few wires snapping. She shoved it into her pack. Then she turned her back on Teddy and walked numbly to the hatch. He deserved a funeral. No, he deserved a life. Dental Teddy, whose greatest fear had been hurting someone he loved, who had spent his whole life sacrificing to protect other people. He deserved to live for only himself. And now he was dead. She climbed down the ladder far enough for leverage, then jammed her spear against the cube until it slid out of the way. The hatch slammed shut, sealing them in the darkness. Inez let herself drop the few feet to the ground, the jarring of pain in her ankles a welcome sensation. Where's Teddy? Holden asked. Don't say his name, Inez said, her voice trembling with rage or sorrow. She picked rage. Rage was easier. You don't get to say his name. He didn't even think we were real, and he was willing to sacrifice himself for us. She stood, clutching her spear. She wanted to hurt Holden. She wanted him to feel what she was feeling. It was his fault. His choice that had killed Teddy. And she would make him pay. A few of the others cried out in shock and sadness. She felt the ghost of a hand on her shoulder. But she didn't soften under it. She couldn't soften. She wouldn't. She would wield her pain like a weapon and... Teddy's easy smile flashed in front of her eyes. She took a deep breath, passing a shaking hand over her face. I'm the lifeguard, she thought. It's on me, no one else. For now, all they could do was move forward. And the only way they could do that was together. She would be the best parts of herself to honor what Teddy thought of her. Teddy's dead. She let the words fall from her mouth, let the darkness carry them away along with her anger and rage. She put her hand on Saya's hand, where it still rested on her shoulder. Let's not waste what he did for us. Hey, guys. Hiram's voice was too bright for the darkness, too light for the weight in Inez's soul. It shone around them, brighter than the dim illumination of their lamps. The tunnel's clear as far as I went. We should have a straight shot out of the city. Inez turned, jaw set in grim determination. No one else is allowed to die. We're all getting out of here alive. For Teddy. Teddy? 
Hiram asked, stricken. For Teddy, everyone echoed softly. Inez took the first step into the dark unknown ahead of them. Let's go find our fucking future, then. In the forest, in the clearing, between the two sleeping caretakers, there was a door. On the door, there was a panel. On the panel, there was a single image shaped like a human hand, glowing faintly, waiting. Remade is a Realm original production. You're listening to Remade Season 1 by Kirsten White. Produced by Realm, your portal to another world. Listen away. Remade is a Realm original production, created by Matthew Cody and written by Matthew Cody, Andrea Phillips, Carrie Harris, E.C. Myers, Kirsten White, and Gwenda Bond. Produced by Lydia Shama and executive produced by Julian Yap and Molly Barton. Starring Greg Tremblay and Laurel Schroeder. Audio directed, produced, and sound designed by Amanda Rose Smith. Additional editing by Corey Barton. Original theme composed by Amanda Rose Smith. Cover art by Liz Castle. Find more shows like Remade by following Realm on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, or at realm.fm.